Well, so I'll start with myself. Um, this is me at the age of nine when I got my first camera. And uh, I think my parents gave it to me because they thought I was good for nothing and maybe I would develop an interest. And I did develop an interest and eventually I became a photographer. Um, I always wanted to travel. I was born and brought up in communist Czechoslovakia and we couldn't travel. And it was one, my, one of my big, big interests because um, I just read books, I saw films, and I wanted to travel. Um, so I decided when I get an opportunity, I'm going to leave the country, and I'm going to live in the West, which is free, and I can travel. Uh, the opportunity came in 1968, when I was 18, and the Russians invaded. And I thought I just needed to get out. And I left the day after the invasion, and I hitchhiked all the way to England, where I actually did become a photographer. I went to college, I um, started working for the NGOs, and I had a sideline in doing interviews for the British Journal of Photography. And one of the persons I interviewed was uh, Tim Page, and Tim Page was a British photographer who almost like me left England at the age of 17 and made his way to, in, uh, to Vietnam where he became a war photographer. And then he got very badly injured. He got, uh, spent 10 years in uh, recovery and then he came to England um, and had an exhibition. I interviewed him and I asked him um, how many of his pictures were ever published and he said, most of my pictures have never been published. And I always remember that because when I got into photography, I started working for the NGOs and for the UN, and I actually wanted all my pictures to be published, which were good, and I wanted people to see you know, what, how people lived and how, um, how very important it is to show different uh, lifestyle and different way of living, which in most countries of the third world, the developing world, is very, very poor. And um, of course, editors think differently. They think, you know, we just show one and there is no space and there is no money. Um, we had a very funny experience um, with a journalist when we went to Uganda to do a story on child soldiers in Uganda. It was a very important story, very dangerous, and not done very often because um, you, you, know, you could easily get killed. So we arrived in Kampala and we made all the arrangements to go up north and photograph the Lord's Resistance Army children who had been abducted by, uh, by Joseph Kone. And as we are sitting in the hotel on the morning of departure, uh, we see a television screen in the corner and it says uh, Diana, Princess Diana is dead. And I said to Emma, the journalist, I said, Emma, there goes our story. They will never ever publish it now because it's all going to be about Diana. Uh, we did the story, came back, and sure enough, um, the magazine said, oh, no, no, you know, there is like too much else going on. Diana is very important. There was nothing else in the magazine than Diana. And uh, um, Emma actually threatened to take them to court and they eventually published the story. But they didn't think it was important enough. Um, Diana was more important. Um, anyway, there was a kind of bug of hysteria going on around London with Diana's death and there were flowers everywhere and people were mourning in a very open way. And I talk, uh, caught the bug and I also went out to take pictures. And in the end, um, paradoxically, they became my best-selling pictures ever <laughs> of piles of flowers um, outside Kensington Palace. So these are the boys uh, from the Lord's Resistance Army. It's a war which still goes on. It has moved finally after about 20 years from Uganda to, to the Congo. These children are children who were abducted and then they were trained as killers basically and then they were caught by um, 
either the Ugandan army or they managed to escape. And they were in a kind of center in, um, in Gulu, in the north of Uganda, to be kind of made into human beings again because they were apparently very dangerous. They were quite violent. Their parents didn't want them. They committed terrible crimes. They all knew that. This was a boy who came uh, with the army. They brought him in. They called him. He looks totally devastated. He was very shaken. Most of these boys, they uh, didn't want to talk. Um, this is another boy who was cut up uh, during an escape attempt. Um, these boys, they just have so much to tell and they are completely unable to tell it. They, their lives are ruined. Some of them manage to um, pick up again, but very often a day they just become very, very sad, depressed people. This was a village we went to the day after it was burned by, after an attack by the LRA, Lord's Resistance Army, it was completely burned and people were just sitting there not really knowing what uh, they can do. This was a boy in a hospital, again, a whole village burnt out, a hospital full of people, uh, the medical staff worked all the time, the whole night, they patched them up and they, um, they sort of made them comfortable. <coughs> This was another um, occasion where um, these girls were all abducted. There was 130 girls abducted from a private Catholic school by the Lord's Resistance Army. They were walked into southern Sudan where they had bases at that time. And um, in the end, the mother superior, who was an Italian nun, she walked by herself with a guide all the way practically to southern Sudan, they caught up with the, uh, with the army and they gave them 110 girls back and kept the rest. They were, um, the, the nun was just completely shaken. She couldn't stop talking about it. She was crying all the time. Well, the end result is that they were in the end thrown from their bases in southern, southern Sudan and they are now in the Congo. And because the Congo is a jungle area, it's very difficult to, to do anything about it. They, uh, nobody's particularly interested in catching them. They don't know where they are. And the, the girls and the boys who had been uh, captured and managed to escape, they have completely ruined lives. Um, this is another story which is from Bangladesh. Um, it's a story of Bina who was burnt by acid attacks and um, she basically got it because she was sleeping in a bed next to her cousin and the cousin was uh, the object of the attack but her cousin Bina got it instead and in fact Bina uh, was the first person who was completely disfigured facially and who wasn't covering herself and she decided that she was going to do something about it so she campaigned on behalf of the girls and um, trying to stop it, trying to make it a criminal offense. Um, I think it is a criminal offense in Bangladesh, but the problem is that the, um, it's very difficult to prove who threw the acid. So um, the police, they may arrest the boys and there is no evidence, so they let them go again. I believe Bina is now in Washington and being a very active activist. Um, this is another sad story of a um, girl from Sierra Leone. Uh, they chopped their, they used to chop their arms. It was a, it was a war over uh, mineral resources. Um, the, the country is very rich in diamonds, and uh, the rebels, their trademark was to attack a village, and if people didn't go, want to go with them, they would chop their arms. And they didn't really care how old or how young the person was, and. Um, there were hundreds and thousands of people with chopped limbs. Um, this was another sad story that was from, um, from Rwanda after the Rwandan war where um, about a million people were killed. A million people went uh, as refugees to Tanzania and another million um, to the Congo. You come from trips like this, you have your photographs and you want to tell everybody about it. And 
people actually are very cagey about listening to it. They are either tell you, don't show me, it's too sad, I don't want to spoil my day, or they are more interested in telling you their story, what happened to them while you were away. And I always found that very, very upsetting, because for me, it was always so important, you know, I chose to do these stories because I wanted to, allow, to tell the world about how the other side of the world lives. Uh, so in the end, you know, it became my little solitary um, uh, profession, my, my experiences, which I could never really tell anybody, and the people who wanted to see the pictures, there were very few and far between. I think I'm showing them more now than after the events. Uh, this was another uh, nice uh, visit I did with a friend who, who is Czech and he knows the Tsemai in southern Ethiopia. He has been there guest many times, he has got his brothers, cousins, you know how it goes. And he took me there. And it was a fascinating experience because none of them speak any English. They are one of the uh, very small tribes down in the lower Omo Valley in southern Ethiopia. And they have got an advantage over their other cousins, other tribes, that they are not very interesting. They don't cut their faces, they don't tattoo themselves too much, they don't put plates into incisions in their lips. So nobody goes to see them, you know. Tourists don't come and they don't get paid for tourists taking pictures of them. So they live very, very primitive, but very, very original lives because not many of them can go and buy clothes in the local markets. So they, they just wear their traditional clothes. They uh, still dress up for uh, little festivals. They make tea by uh, just striking two pieces of stone, they um, make fire, then they make their local tea, which um, I never even tried. They are very, very friendly. This is Bezi, who is a kind of a modern at Semai because he has a mobile phone, and he, it was the only one in the whole settlement who had mobile phone. He used it quite often, but I don't know who he was calling because I couldn't talk to him. But um, it definitely wasn't anybody from his village, because that was the only phone I, I found there. Um, they get uh, now, if they have money, they go and buy uh, plastic plates, otherwise they just eat from communal bowl. Um, also, they are slightly looked after, so the government comes and maybe uh, builds a water pipe. And, and a water pump, and so they can go and get water which is clean, otherwise they get water from quite dirty streams. This is how they grind their flour. They live in very tiny um, houses, uh, round houses, um, with roofs which leak in the rainy season. Um, they dress up in, in uh, very, uh, I suppose, imaginative way. So if they uh, buy something new, and they often buy shoes because the ground is very uh, hard and very rough, um, but they use their own traditional decorations. Um, they, uh, this is probably the most decoration they will ever have. And then they go dancing, and uh, people dance in a very, kind of strange way, they just hop up and down and um, they are supposed to attract their partners. It's a kind of a find your girlfriend type of dance. They don't eat very much meat, but in our honor they, they kill the um, goat. And then they perform the ceremony where uh, they take the guts of the goat and put it on somebody who thinks she's sick on her stomach and it's supposed to draw out all the, all the, the, the disease and all the bad things from her body. They are very nice people and they just simply failed to attract tourists because they are not commercial, they are not people who will go and um, do uh, strange things to make themselves more attractive. So they still live much poorer than their neighbors who get paid for photographs and they are visited by busloads of people.
This is another country which I really like, and it's Somalia. Uh, I, I've been going to Somalia and Somaliland, you know, since 1995 when I went for the first time. And um, since then, the country went through a really rough war, and it was divided into Somalia and Somaliland. This picture is from Somaliland. It's, it's a country which hasn't been internationally recognized. Nobody seems to be interested in recognizing them internationally, so they have to look after themselves. And they have got a lot of people who work abroad, and they send money back. And after the war, because it was completely flattened, apparently there wasn't a single building, st building standing, they, uh, they completely rebuilt it with their own resources because nobody helps them. And they live their normal, ordinary lives. They do things which... Uh, which they have always done, except for when they were in the war and um, they had to run. There was nobody left in the whole, in Hargeisa, the capital, in the whole country. They are very nice people and I always feel sorry that if I say I'm going to Somaliland, people don't know where it is. And also they don't really recognize that uh, Somaliland is not Somalia and Somalia is a very violent country. They have managed to destroy everything by themselves, and they don't seem to be able to get their act together, but these people, they are just living normal lives, they have rebuilt it, they have had practically no international help, and they have no crime, they have no terrorist attacks, except for a um, few attacks which came from the north, from the south. Um, I find them fascinating because they are very, very traditional in many ways and they cover themselves up. But when they go to a wedding, they, um, they spend, the girls spend like a whole afternoon, evening in a, a beauty salon and um, they put on Western clothes. They, uh, they have a, a whole a line of dresses, wedding dresses from the West, which they can hire and borrow. And uh, then they go out and they put this big kind of blanket over their heads to cover their faces and they go to their wedding. And it's usually at midnight, the wedding starts at midnight. <clears throat> and this is something which I've never understood because I think they really don't look terribly nice. They have um, tons of makeup and they have got these wonderful clothes which they can which they can adapt to something more celebratory, but they do wear Western clothes. Uh, the children are always smiling. They are very, uh, very happy children, and they, some of them are, uh, cover their faces, some of them cover their heads, some of them don't, depends on how religious they are. They are always welcoming visitors. They, um, I don't think they have a nasty streak in their, in their character. Um, and the women, they look very serene and, and um, closed when they're outside, but they go and they s practice sports. They um, take their clothes off, they run around, uh, they play basketball, they, they have a basketball team which is uh, playing in international games. And then you have the other side of, of uh, Somaliland, and that's the nomads who actually lost most of their animals during the war. And uh, they came back from Ethiopia where they ran to and settled down as internal refugees on the edge of the capital Hargeisa. And they are never going to be able to rebuild their stock again. Um, this is outside, this is the happy nomads who have got um, animals, who've managed to uh, somehow at least save one or buy one. This is a, um, a schooling because they ha haven't been to school for uh, you know, 20 years practically. And uh, so UNICEF um, organized books for them, they printed completely new books and they're starting to school themselves. This again, you know, portrait which I really like because these people have amazing eyes. A little orphan girl, there are lots of orphans who lost their parents during the war. 
And this is, for me, is the picture of um, kind of happiness, optimism, you know, looking forward to the future. It's street children in Hargeisa who are uh, in a circus. Again, the circus has been going on for several years, and now they travel around the world, around Africa, and they participate in festivals. <laughs> One photo won't change the world but they can provoke thought and they can record history. And what I'd like to show you is, uh, carrying on from where Lieber left off, just some of the work that we've done just publishing pictures in The Economist. It doesn't matter how good the photos are and what risks the photographer's taken to get them, unless they can reach an audience, they can't be seen. And Change is formed by opinion, and photographs can focus attention on issues. So The Economist was uh, first published in 1843, and under the masthead of The Economist, there's a quote from Edmund Burke, who was actually an Irishman, but was a member of the British Parliament. And uh, it says that, um, he warns that uh, we should actively um, expand the sphere of our awareness. Um, everything about us otherwise will dwindle by degrees until uh, at length our concerns are shrunk to the dimensions of our minds. It's very important for us to be open-minded about things. And that's the philosophy on which The Economist was founded, and I hope that that continues through the use of photos to some extent today. It took a very long time for photos to be used in The Economist. Um, over 100 years before Fidel Castro made it onto a cover in 1959. I don't know why him particularly. Um, and uh, it was 1960 before we used the first photograph. Photographs have been used ever since. Obviously, there would have been some skeptics amongst the journalists. Even today, there are people who think that words should be the only thing in The Economist and that photos simply break up the text and get in the way of them. But um, we use photographs, um, hopefully, to tackle serious matters, sometimes in a humorous way. This is um, a very, very boring and standard photo opportunity at a G20 summit. Um, but when Silvio Berlusconi stood down as Italian Prime Minister in 2011, we wanted to run a cover that would mark that event. And uh, that gesture was a nice one because he'd had a somewhat colorful career as Prime Minister of Italy. And uh, we thought that perhaps combining that with a suitable party scene, this is called The Romans of Decadence by Thomas Couture, um, which made our farewell cover to a man who had enlivened our lives quite a lot. Sometimes less is more. This was our 2008 um, uh, election cover. Um, this was a, a young senator who'd been uh, followed by photojournalists for about a year. There was quite a lot of material to choose from. I think it took me about three days, no pressure. Um, but I had to choose uh, some images which were suitable for our endorsement of him. And uh, we settled on that one, which actually was my favorite all along. I don't always get my way, but that was one time. The picture business um, still industry is worth about um, two billion dollars per annum. So it's not insubstantial, though I know in comparison with some of the other speakers that will be a small business. Um, while print is reducing in some areas of the media, um, the uh, opportunities for photojournalism in electronic media are actually very exciting. It's uh, a media which lends itself very well to photographs, and backlit photographs look a lot better than ones which have been badly printed on paper. And um, so one of the ways that we've been able to take advantage of that with The Economist is to make little videos about uh, photojournalists and about their work. And if any of you have friends who are photojournalists, you'll know that they're extremely good raconteurs, usually over a beer. But if you can get them into a sound studio and record their commentary about their work, it's very insightful. They're natural communicators. They have to 
work in a lot of strange environments, often at short notice, and they have to integrate into those environments. So they are people who are very aware of the detail of their surroundings. In order to compose good photographs, they have to be. And Jürgen Schaderberg um, is a, actually a German photographer who moved to South Africa in 1951. He got to know Nelson Mandela very early on when he first moved there, and they remain friends ever since. And when Nelson Mandela went out to Robben Island for the first time, he returned there since his imprisonment in 1994. Um, Jürgen described this photograph very movingly. He said that it was a very reflective time for Mr. Mandela, even though he was surrounded by a, a lot of photographers and press at the time, that he walked into his former cell, this particular cell he'd been in for 17 years. And he said he was very quiet, very still, and that he could feel the 17 years there. Stuart Franklin was out in uh, China in Beijing photographing the student uprisings in 1989. And during my interview with him, he said that one of the challenges for a still photographer in a news environment is to somehow find photographs that will either be symbolic or become symbolic. This young man was never seen or heard of again. We don't know what happened to him. Um, but that is the symbol of Chinese oppression of um, the students. Very bright, promising. It was hard to get into Beijing University. Very bright students who demanded initially just a lack of corruption amongst the elite. Um, the same photographer um, then uh, happily went out to Tanzania. And if you say you don't like rats, think again. Um, these Rats are amazing. They're, it was an interview I did with um, Bart Wiegens, who founded a charity called the Popo. And they train the giant African pouch rats to do two things, to search for unexploded ordnance, landmines, and thus free up agricult valuable agricultural land um, and return it to the people who've been too scared to farm, had to move away from it. They also check TB samples. They're a, a, a second line of defense whereas conventional testing for TB is expensive, these little rats can sniff out a positive TB sample at a fraction of the cost and have saved hundreds of lives and obviously prevented cross-infection as well. This was a story that Stephanie Sinclair had been covering since 2003 in Afghanistan. Um, child brides, girls as young as eight, are married off either to settle debts that their parents or fathers usually, obviously, have run up in gambling, um, or just to raise money um, for impoverished families that they belong to, they're sold off. Marcus Bleasdale, who's also with the Agency 7, um, who Ron Haviv is as well, um, he spoke very movingly about how rape is used as a, a weapon to um, not only against the civilians, but to deliberately de destroy communities. Particularly, he was working in Congo, um, DRC, and he spoke about one of the challenges for him, which was to try to communicate in still images the um, brutality of these attacks, but also at the same time to protect the anonymity of the women and sometimes the girls. Um, who were attacked both by government and rebel soldiers, both sides, so you get this perfect storm of attack. Back in print, this is 2005. Um, I perhaps should have warned you there would be a couple of images that are quite strong. Um, in 2005, um, this is just one incident in Iraq. This was um, an incident where one child was killed and 15 civilians were injured in a combined car bomb and IED attack. The Army, US Army, has some amazing photographers. Um, they are by necessity anonymous. Don McCullen, who's I think probably one of the greatest living war photographers, has talked about the hateful injustice of the suffering of children and women uh, and civilians in general in war. And this particular picture also reminds me very strongly of 
the picture of um, Bailey Ullman being uh, taken away from the devastated federal building in Oklahoma City, which was um, uh, something that we used on our cover the day that that happened, but just in composition. And we do think long and hard about um, using this kind of imagery. We're very aware that it's very strong. I'm very aware that our readers all bring their own individual interpretation and perspective to pictures when they see them. But somehow, sometimes uh, devastation is on such a vast scale that until it's personalized to the individual whose life has been shattered by the event, it's very hard to relate to that. And this was in the aftermath of the 2004 Christmas tsunami, uh, where uh, Arco Data took a photograph of a man grieving for his eight-year-old son. Goran Tomasiewicz is um, um, not a small man. He's, he's physically quite powerful. He told me a lovely story about covering the uprisings in the early days of, of the Arab Spring. And um, he said that he was sweating so hard from the gas mask, the, the uh, flak jacket with media written on it, uh, and the helmet, that he could hardly see whether the photographs were actually in focus. Um, it's probably slightly harder to get out of Louisiana State Penitentiary to get in as a photographer, but Laurie Wasselcheck managed it and took a very honest set about life meaning life in Angola. So we are using pictures to indicate to the reader what to expect from the text. We have some limitations constrained by the layout and by the words. Obviously, it's the economist, words are priority. But hopefully we can add a little uh, dimension and a twist to the stories. So in The Economist each week we publish um, a statement which says that The Economist exists to take part in a severe uh, contest between intelligence which presses forward and an unworthy, timid ignorance which prevents progress, obstructs progress. And I hope that with the photographs that we use, we can do that. I will leave you with um, one of my favorite covers, which is if Kim Jong-il, we were dealing with the issue of a nuclear North Korea. And uh, if you take one dictator and you initiate ignition, just stand back. <laughs> Thank you.